Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy, and I'm so pleased that we're here for part two uh, with Jody Helpern, from, uh, who is Associate Professor of Community Health and Human Development at UC Berkeley and has written the book uh, From Detached Concern to Empathy, Humanizing Medical uh, Practice. And we're, what we're doing is we've gone, we're going through the book chapter by chapter and we've done chapter one and chapter two, so now we want to continue with uh, ch with a chapter three, which is called emotional reasoning. So, um, would you like to start or with uh, what that's uh, the chapter is about? And well, I think chapter three. Um, uh, my background when I wrote this book was I had just um, finished a PhD in philosophy as well as I was in, the, in my psychiatry residency. And so in this chapter, I felt um, a need to really tackle the, the, the recent research at that time um, in philosophy of mind relating to philosophy of the emotions. And there's a very strong question in philosophy, which still is a big debate, about the degree to which emotions um, involve beliefs about reality and are part of our cognition and influence cognition. And as we talked about last time, there's a whole a lot of research since then showing that decision making that people thought was more purely um, uh, detached cognition is really seen more and more to be emotion based. So there's a, a very exciting area showing that um, emotions play a role in how we apprehend reality. But at the time that I wrote this book in 2001 originally, um, the biggest um, popular view was still a Cartesian view that I've mentioned last time of um, the, uh, the, of rational deliberation or deliberation about reality, truth-seeking, scientific thinking as requiring an interest in finding out the truth that was completely independent of any strategic motives. So that to be a pure knower required detaching from your own emotions and interests which might influence you to sort of wishful thinking or um, you know the way love is blind or anger um, makes us see bad things in people. The whole view, the spectrum of folk wisdom that to get to um, the truth about things we needed to be emotionally detached. So this is my chapter where I try to show that um, each of the reasons that emotions are seen to um, uh, obscure realistic thinking are valid. Um, the, the traditions, the observations about emotions having problems that don't operate cognitively like pure beliefs do are valid, but they don't entail or um, implicate the view that emotions therefore make us unrealistic. Mm. That was what I was really trying to show in the chapter. And the, to say it in simpler terms, just because our emotions have some strategic goals, which is to help us maintain our sense of selves, doesn't mean that they can't also be reality seeking. And the most important um, uh, example since the book is about empathy is that I my fundamental argument is that to be realistic about social reality to be realistic about how another person is feeling to be realistic about how our interaction is going with another person to be realistic historically and whether we're in tribes and about to be in conflicts with each other or making peace all of those forms of emotional um, insight and empathy if they weren't really realistic if people weren't very accurate in those uh, apprehensions of the truth about what was happening socially with other people, people would not have survived very well. Um, and, and it's just very much like the, the same idea would be, um, well, I'll, I'll give the, the example later in the chapter. But that's what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't mean just because emotions do serve goals of maintaining our sense of self and um, fulfilling our subjective interests at times does not mean that they can't at the very same time and actually necessarily have a reality seeking function. Mm. That's what the yeah, so, yeah, so there's been, this kind of fits into the philosophical framework yeah. which, which you've mentioned, you, you're, you studied philosophy and it's been a real, and you bring in so much of the, of the philosophy in, into the book as well, is that philosophers and, and George Lakoff has written about this kind of extensively that uh, uh, enlightenment reasoning said that we kind of come to uh, understanding through just this detached, unembodied uh, reasoning, yes. which which has nothing to do with the body, but it's all kind of a logic-based way, and that should be our way to, um, you know, I think, therefore I am, or something yes. like that, right? And that uh, now it's like, 
uh, well, that's not quite right. It's like without the emotions, without we can't even know what we want to what we want to do. We can't even we need those emotions and those experiences and those sensations. Uh, one just to kind of uh, deal with inter inter uh, act with the world as yeah. well as uh, yeah. So it's is that. That's great. And you actually came up with one of the most fundamental points that I didn't say, which I think is really important, which is um, very much the recent thinking in philosophy, psychology, and behavioral economics is, and neuroscience is what you were talking about is the idea that we need emotions to give us, um, to focus our attention in the first place. And the usual phrase is that emotions determine salience. Um, they, they, because we care about something, or we're afraid of something, or we're attracted to something, or we're, we're repelled by something, we're going to act, interact with it with specific modes of attention. And that otherwise there would just be an infinite array of things to do or pay attention to, and we wouldn't be able to sort of live a, a, a real-time life and get anything done or pursue anything. So emotions are actually very important for framing our attention. And that's in the micro moment, as I'll talk about, but that's also the kind of emotional thing that you know makes a musician pursue music, or I would say a, a medical scientist pursue, pursue science. So um, there's an emotional scaffolding to human motivation that is just as important for motivating cognition as it is for motivating um, where we walk or what we do physically. And that's what we finally are grasping, is that we need an emotional scaffolding behind and, and 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 to direct cognition and this chapter you're you're exploring that that aspect of it um, I, don't, I don't know if we went there you, you'd kind of broken it into different uh, sections like the one was associated linking was like the first yeah. one yeah yeah Maybe I'll go yeah go through that or do okay. you have another way of approaching it no I can just briefly go through <laughs> what, what I did because again this book begins with the idea that I'm talking to deans of medical and nursing and social work schools and telling them why, as well as patients, and saying we need doctors to be trained really differently and social workers and nurses are, have some of this right but even they sometimes are asked to be detached and we need this for certain reasons and so in this chapter I always start with the biases or views that I think are part of popular culture. So I start with what people have said for millennia about why emotions are disruptions to reasoning. And each section is one way in which emotions can, quote, disrupt reasoning. And then I try to show that even though the, the um, popular folklore about emotions in each case are, is, tr is accurate, um, the idea that it means that, that emotions can't contribute to reality is wrong. Mm. So the first one is called associational linking. And it's basically association goes back to the way the mind can work. And, you can think of this as, uh, for those interested in psychoanalysis, it's Freud's primary process, or for artists, it's primary process. But the idea is, instead, there's two, and, and recently we have books by Daniel Kahneman and other people about type one and type two thinking. So this would be all the thinking that is thought of as intuitive or automatic. Often it's, it's not even conscious, um, but we look at a, a very simple uh, experiment that the psychologists have done is they'll write the word red in green ink and they'll ask you to say the mm. word. And instead of reading it as red, people will accidentally read it as green because it's colored green. And what they're showing is that we have these shortcuts by which we see things very much based on associations we're making to them, to the color of them, the smell of them, the sound of them. And it's what we do with dreaming. And so what, what I think is, maybe I'm not being clear enough, our minds connect things by the senses, by emotions, and not just by their logical uh, structure. And so that we also can do logical reasoning, which takes longer and can involve processes in different parts of the brain as well. But this first very basic shortcut is, um, you know, obviously, uh, I'm thinking of an example of it. If I, if I have um, a bad experience somewhere, and I am going to the same place, and there's no chance that's, I mean, I'm thinking again, unfortunately, of New, Newtown and Connecticut, and why they may never open that school again. There's, you know, virtually, you know, no chance that that school is going to become, the, if they did open it, would become the place of another shootout. Um, but after, you know, children were murdered and teachers were murdered there, 
everyone will have bad associations to the school. And it's irrational in the sense that there's no logical reason to see the school as a bad place to be anymore. But it's deeply inflected by feelings that come up when they think of the school, or even when we say the words Newtown, Connecticut now. Um, and the same is true of us all the time. I mean, if I am someone who um, lost someone I love and spent my last days with them, um, uh, you know, listening to certain music, then forever when I listen to the music, that's what will come to mind for me. Mm. So we are in inherently uh, associational thinkers. Not we don't just think the next logical thought. We are, our mind is always shaped by memory and history and emotions and sensation, and that's what I mean by associational linking. Oh, okay. So it's that. Um, so subjective. Subjective. So, so uh, initially, there's this idea that we have to doctors need to be detached, um, emotionally detached. Yes. And that you're saying no, that's not. You know, we, we need to use our emotions. And there, there were criticisms of emotions of how emotions work. And you're kind of going into some of the, the each ways criticism. that it, each criticism. And this one is that you know that these emotions are attached. So you're saying that it's like if you write something in the color blue. I mean, write it, write green in the color blue, that you actually see it as maybe uh, green. I mean, you see it as, you see the green as blue because you've had that association. Well, you'll say it wrong. You may not you'll say it wrong. I'm even saying it, yeah. I'm yeah, even saying it wrong here. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I, I was pretty quick with this. I don't know if I was very clear, but let me just say, um, you'll, you'll make mistakes because uh -huh. you won't just see things logically. You'll have your own personal or sensory, in this case it's not personal, but it's a sensory issue, but there'll be something besides the logical meaning of a word or the next logical thought in a scientific deduction making a diagnosis. Your mind will go to places. Your mind doesn't operate. It doesn't perform in the step-by-step -step fashion. Mm. Cart Cartesian science, mm -hmm. Descartes' um, famous book, The Rules, developed the first model of the scientific method by the idea that there should be nothing taking us from one thought to the next thought except logic. And that the only way to make sure that our thoughts would behave in such a way that they would just go from one logical step always to the next step, as if in a mathematical proof, would be if we make sure we weren't constantly being diverted by the subjectivity of emotion. So I'm taking up that very idea that emotions are always diverting us in these personal or sensory or other subjective associations that they hold. And I'm saying right on that does make us not just logic inferring machines. Um, that is true. So what do we do about it? And then what, I, what I'm suggesting, and the book makes the argument throughout the book, but what I begin to suggest here is, in fact, this is your point about salience. If we didn't have meaning and associations in this way, we would miss a lot of um, that which motivates us to pay attention in the first place. So first of all, it would be very, we just wouldn't be able to motivate ourselves to be these logical automata. But secondly, when we're thinking about medicine and not fixing a physical mechanism alone, but dealing with a human being who's subject to suffering and a personal history, we need to understand the patient's associations. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the most important reason for empathy, which is what this book is about. You know, this is a big topic, philosophy of mind, but a small application of it is related to empathy, which is if a person, a patient, suddenly refuses a procedure, it could be because her friend, you know, died during that procedure, as opposed to just what I've told her about the specific objective risks and benefits. Or if a patient has a panic attack at 49, as someone just reported to me recently, um, and is convinced they're dying of a heart attack, um, it could be because her father died of a heart attack at that exact age. And if I don't understand what this, why things are going on from an associative position for the patient, I'm missing most of what can help me understand the patient's history and help them be adherent to treatment. And what I'm going to ultimately argue in the next two chapters is the only way that I can follow the patient's associative linkages is because I'm capable of making associative linkages. Oh, I see. So you have to develop those skills for making those associations uh, to empathize. Well, you have to be able to, and you have to be able to engage that kind of thinking, that primary process thinking, while you're listening to the patient. It's just not. It's not the only thing you're doing. And the idea that you can't do both 
is something that people still debate about, but you don't have to do them both at the exact same set, you know, second by second. But as a physician, for all the reasons I've begun to talk about, about curiosity in the Ms. G case and what was missing in terms of curiosity, we're going to have to do both. You know, we're going to have to both resonate with Ms. G, which involves associative linkages. All her doctors associated to the idea that their own feelings, their life would be not worth living if they were stuck with, in, you know, using a wheelchair and their spouse left them. That was associative linkages that they were making. So we have and, to just acknowledge that that's how the brain works. And yes, whether you, whether you yes. like it or not, your brain yes. is working in this way with associative All linkings. So yes. you have to be aware of that as the doctor yourself that you're making associations and the patient is making associations. So that's happening and that maybe even is based on the, the neuroscience of neurons that fire together, wired together. Yes. In the sense that, uh, you yes. know, if you're, if you're going home when you're, when you're a child and you're, your mother is baking bread and there's that smell of the bread and then the, the love of your mother, you know, and the, you know, the taste of the fresh hot bread. It's yes. like all those experiences yes. are wired together in your brain. So when you kind of fire one of those experiences, it's firing a whole network of experience of associated linkages feelings then. And, and thank God it does. It's why when things are tough, we go home and bake bread ourselves as adults because we can bring back a lot of that comfort and those memories. Um, and that makes me almost cry again, again, again about the children in Newtown, Connecticut, because I've heard some of the closer family members now begin to think, and you can see how beautifully um, valuable the associations will be to them, to the sensory memories um, of their terrible loss. Um, but I don't, uh, uh, anyway, we are always making associations. And if you think of rationality and science as ultimately requiring an awareness of all the data that influences our thinking, that to not be aware that what's actually shaping our thinking, scaffolding it, forming it, directing it, is associative linking. You're missing a lot of what's going on with your own thinking, and you're going to be a poor diagnostician if you're not aware of those influences. And you can correct for them better if you're aware of those influences. Mm -hmm. So they help you listen to the patient empathically because you need to be able to literally resonate with them. Resonance to me involves not just a feeling state, a uh, sensation, but it's actually linking associatively to the patient's associations. It's linking to the other person's links. And that is how um, we have this kind of capacity to, to follow another person's meanings. And so it's a very rich source of history and information about another person. And at the same time, we need to be aware of it because there could be lots of our own idiosyncratic associations that can sometimes um, lead us to make mistakes. So it operates, we need to be aware of associations that both make them and then be reflective about them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that was really clear. I really enjoyed understanding that component. Well, kind of cleared, cleared it, clear, Good. clarified a lot for me. Good. Good. And uh, so with your, your, uh, your case study, uh, the, the woman who, uh, had diabetes and her husband left her and there was just this whole there's this whole set of associations that she had and that the doctors had their set of associations yes. and it was it was important for the doctors to have really to heard her and to see in the full associations uh, that she's having with all these different experiences to really hear them and to uh, and to go deeper in them to um, because it's part of the recovery, I guess, process then. Yes. yes. And a very specific example that could have made a huge therapeutic difference is when she yelled at me so at, with such intensity and anger, um, you know, making me talk about this as the worst thing anyone has ever done to me, the words worst thing that anyone has ever done to me. Now I see associatively how much they evoke the idea of what her husband did. That was the worst thing that he did. He did the worst thing anyone had ever done to her, which was what she was trying to talk about. But I and the other doctors and nurses were just busy trying not to harm or cause pain, and we ran away from her when she was really sharing her associations. But we had our own feelings of guilt and inadequacy in reaction to that. Okay. So um, 
Did that, that feel complete with that yes, part? Yes, okay, yes. so then there's a gut feeling. Uh, in a way, the one we just did is the most complicated one. I think the others are, are easier. Um, gut feelings, everyone's very aware that we have very, this is, goes again to the quick emotional reaction. So a tiger charges me, I don't have to think about whether to run away. Um, in fact, if there's animals where you're not supposed to run, it's really hard to teach yourself not to run <laughs> because we are very hardwired to have um, very strong emotional reactions to dangerous stimuli. We're hardwired to get nauseous in response to rotting things. Um, we have a whole set of emotional and feeling reactions to things that are automatic. So gut feelings are often quite automatic. Um, and they can um, help us, they help us survive, but they can also steer us wrong. And uh, I give the example of a patient, um, this is from uh, Patricia Greenspan's work, this example, of a, uh, she wasn't talking about a patient, but a person, but in my case it would be a patient who avoids eye contact when I'm talking with them. We have a reaction, most of us, that when someone really doesn't look at us, we feel they're being evasive, and we feel suspicious, or that we, we feel kind of a little bit of um, anxiety or suspicion when people don't make eye contact with us. Um, but I said, you know, it could very well be that the person's from a culture in which a woman's not supposed to make eye contact with other people. So it could be that this, this eye contact gap that is making me feel that the person's not being straight with me or the person's avoiding something could actually just be a cultural or other thing, but it evokes a gut feeling in me. And so that could cause a mistake, just like the red-green writing mistake. Um, but if I'm aware that I have gut feelings and that my immediate reaction to someone might be based on something like that, then I can, I can correct for it better. So this is a, an attunement, kind of attuning to your feelings and, and knowing this is how the body works, that you have these gut feelings, these uh, subconscious feelings that come up kind of automatically, and to be aware of that, is that what you're saying, to be aware that this happens? Or? Yeah, yes, I mean the reason I take it up in this way in the structure of the book is that because our emotions can be very automatic in this way, and, not, and they, can ha they can arise before we even get to really know all the information or evidence in a situation. I don't have to know what this tiger has done to other people before I get scared of it. Um, and I don't have to know much about why someone's avoiding eye contact. I feel suspicious first and then I have to think about it. That's why people think doctors have to be detached. So that's why I have to talk about it in the book. And so I say, you're right, we do have reactions sometimes before we have the, enough evidence to merit the reaction. I should say right here, one of the things that I haven't really explained just really quickly is that I am of the philosophical school that emotions involve beliefs and judgments. So they involve a kind of statement about reality. So if, I'm, if I run away from a tiger, in that is the idea that this tiger is dangerous. That's a fact in my psyche. Or if I, so the, so the, the, the logical argument here would be if I think, if I'm feeling suspicion, there's a belief that this person is not being straight with me, but yet they may be very honest and just from a culture where that's not the case, so I'm making a mistake. That's the way mm, they put it. Mm -hmm. So how can I avoid making that mistake? I said, well, we can't because we're going to have gut feelings all the time, but we don't have to act on those gut feelings. We can have them and then question them. But I also go further, as I did in the associative part of the chapter, and say, and they also can be beneficial to us gut feelings. And as a psychiatrist, this is really the area of intuition where you just kind of get a quick take on something. And I, I very often have been with people who have been um, in very withdrawn states and gotten an intuitive sense just from my own resonance and body language that I, is, I'm reading quicker than I can put into thought um, that the person might be very afraid or this person might be actually very angry or this person might be very you know, ready to strike out and this person is ready to run away before I have a lot of evidence of any of that, and while it's not always accurate, it sometimes is accurate in ways that, I mean, it gives me important information uh, because our ability to respond and read each other's nonverbal cues is very rapid, and I would hate to not have that as a psychiatrist. So I think it's very valuable as long as I'm willing to keep it open that I may be making a mistake. All right, so the detached view sees gut reaction as something that's inhibiting, uh, you know, kind of rational right. logic. thought, logic, and that you're saying is that uh, the gut reaction is something that we do automatically and we're going to do it right. and that we should um, be aware that we're doing it and then uh, work with it. And yeah, 
And yeah. the thing was, and uh, I heard apply questions, question it, or yeah, yeah. You know. Like I mean, and sometimes I even say to people, I just get like I've had, you know, sometimes if I see psychiatric patients in the emergency room, they come in and they're not willing to talk to anyone or say anything. They can be completely withdrawn, and so I have to start things going. And like with Ms. G, I had to start it, and I did a guided imagery because I knew she was in pain. So it would have been very unempathic to, you know, act like I, you know, I knew she was in pain. She looked like she was in so much pain. But I'll sometimes see someone in the emergency room where I don't know if they're in pain or they're physical pain or afraid or they've just been um, molested or abused or they're having um, uh, hallucinations or delusions or I have no idea what's going on. And my first job is to sort of be with them and get some kind of connection going. And sometimes I have to get the ball rolling by saying something about my own response and saying something, you know, like I, I sense um, that, you know, I'll usually say a very neutral thing, like I sense you don't really want to be here or something like that. Um, but if I have a feeling that the person might be afraid or sad or something, I might say, I, I, I don't know if this is right, but I'm sensing that it's not feeling very safe here for you or something like that. The person will correct me if I'm wrong or not, but it usually it helps somebody begin to feel that my goal is to try to understand them. So there's also something about the self revelation uh, with, if within, for example, with um, if I think of like Carl Rogers' uh, work with reflective listening and his yeah. his approach is that as a person that, that, that the more you reveal of yourself too, that that can actually facilitate and develop trust, empathy. It, in that sense, it's the sharing of where you are and being honest and open about it. Well, that's a really important thing in certain types of psychotherapies. Um, that's a, to me, that gets into a much deeper, um, so the question of self, I mean, it's a different, this is very deep too, but the question of um, self-disclosure is a complicated one. Mm -hmm. So I would say that I wouldn't be saying much about myself to a patient in the emergency room because they might be paranoid and find that overwhelming, but I'm just sharing the very basic co-humanness of an affect with them, yeah. Okay, so I, I see there's a little bit of a difference there between that and what you're saying. This is more just say, kind of sharing a bit of what you're reading, you're yeah, feeling like saying, from I'm them. Yeah, I'm sensing something, uh -huh. I'm feeling it, I'm acknowledging that I'm a human being though, which a lot of do mm -hmm. doctors don't even do that. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it, it's making the point that I'm in it as a human being, in a sense, and I think that can be very common for people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that that makes that makes sense. I understand good. that part. Uh -huh. Good. Good. So that's enough, probably, on the inertia stuff. Um, moods and temperament. Do you want oh, to was that, that? that? I thought that was gut feeling. This is emotional inertia. Is, oh, I'm sorry. I said I said I nope. It's gut feeling. Uh -huh. um, I just was uh, the next section, which I was about to skip. Interestingly, is inertia, and inertia is also pretty simple and pretty pretty true complaint about emotions and their irrationality, etc. People say, well, you can't trust your emotions because they don't just go away when the evidence no longer warrants it. So um, this is actually what I would, it relates to gut feelings. All these things, you have to tease them out because um, they can all be there in one, they usually all work together, mm -hmm. but a specific thing would be um, that there's something in a place or a time or a thing that I had reason to be afraid of before, but I have no reason to be afraid of now. But even so, the emotions persist. Or nausea, you know, we, emotion, nausea is not an emotion, it's a feeling state, but we know that, you know, if we ever get food poisoning from a particular food, often it, it shows inertia. The rest of our lives, it doesn't go away that we don't want to eat that food. Um, but this is also unfortunately true of grudges, anger, resentment. Um, we can have a conflict with someone mm. and sort of always ju judge their actions in the future in a potentially negative light that's not really warranted. So inertia is when emotions, or we can have an overly rosy view of someone and give them the benefit of the doubt when they might be harmful to us. So basically, inertia is the property of emotions, not only to, um, as, as gut feelings, emotions arise too quickly, not based on the evidence, and inertia is they last too long when the evidence no longer warrants them. That's that's the problem. I see mm -hmm. the problem. Uh, that's kind of one of the, when, what, that was one of the criticisms uh, initially of... Right. Uh, of, um, of emotions. Yes. Uh -huh. And again, this is all the criticism of how emotions get in the way of um, reasoning or mm -hmm. you know, rationality. And so um, having acknowledged that that's all true about emotions, um, I basically, I think one of the most important ways to talk about you know, how that can be dealt with is that um, 
Let me just look at this for a second from the book. Mm -hmm. I think that perhaps maybe the most important point to make in that chapter is that there would be some that part of what it makes an ethical physician is loyalty, commitment, and genuine concern for his or her patients. And if we're going to really care about people in those and have that kind of character to have loyalty and commitment to people, then they're going to leave a mark on us, including um, grieving when they die. And that those kinds of things that people have lasting effects on us are a really important part of the kind of concern that we really want our physicians to have. And since I wrote the book and wrote about the importance of actual um, you know, character-based concern, that it persists, we remember people, we care about them, there's been a lot of research showing that, that um, patients actually are more adherent to treatment when they sense this kind of commitment-based concern, this kind of deeper concern from their physicians. So it really is important for effective care. And all of those things are part of the same emotional um, inertia that also leads to these mistakes. So it's basically because we're not built to just operate as logical automata, always just moving on to the next logical topic. We're actually built to have love and attachment, attachment and commitment, attachment and grief, and all of those things are part of um, the way emotions operate that also have the problem of inertia. So they're all part of the way that emotions um, mark our interests and our concerns and what we notice um, way beyond when a new challenge is just occurring or a new piece of evidence is arising. So we need to be the sort of people that can have lasting um, attachments and commitments to be genuinely caring physicians. So that's why I don't think we really want to be these efficient robotic thinkers who only think about whatever is the most important topic in the moment. Mm -hmm. So that if, if, that, if the doctor was like that, that would just be this cold person and, and people actually need that, that resonance with the doctor, kind of that felt resonance to, to well, feel the humanity. I would say this is actually distinct from resonance because you, mm -hmm. could, okay. I mean, you could be in a sense like someone who just had, let's say, a very, 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 very bad dementia but still had very good emotional responses or something. You could be someone who doesn't ever know who you're talking to but as they show sadness or joy you resonate with it at least at a superficial level. Um, this is having a persistent concern for, for actual real people like the, the patients you've known over time and remembering them and they're you know that that just the same way that people and that so that you're genuinely building uh, a relationship with people over time, not just resonating in the moment with them. I see. Is so it also the motivation? Oh, is it also the motivations of the doctors? Like doctors didn't go into the field to be robots, right? Right. right. They didn't go in. Oh, this is a field where I can be detached and and you know be totally un unemotional. Right. They had they had underlying uh, uh, motivations, emotional motivations that got them into. Right. Well, this it, is in what, the first place. Right. And again, this chapter is just being very philosophical about each type of rationality and its disruption and what it means. But throughout the book, and my whole career since then, um, I've been very involved in in the movements that have tried to show the role of empathy in in physicians not burning out. So that they and a lot of it. Ha there's a lot of research now showing that it's because doctors really care about their patients that they find meaning in their work, and that doctors that have the least burnout are doctors in hospice and palliative care fields, which seem like the saddest areas, but they actually allow the most in-depth human connection with real, real personal and connected relationships that doctors can feel, and that they have the most satisfaction in those fields, and the least when there's the most transience and turnover. So there's a lot of evidence for what you just said, Edwin. Um, but it goes all the way back to the idea that cognitively, yes, the fact that we hold on to feeling-based judgments, this is dangerous, this is happy, I remember this, I, you know, those feeling-based ways of connecting to reality might mean we're not always um, ready, clean slate for the next logical challenge in a completely detached way, but, and so we have to correct for those inertial emotions so that we don't keep judging someone poorly who's no longer acting that way. But we also have to realize that if we didn't have this persistence, we wouldn't have attachment, commitment, and the thing that makes medicine meaningful for doctors and for patients. 
Um, okay, is that uh, was, is that the uh, strategic yeah. nature of emotions? I thought no, you feel no, that's no, the... no, 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 no. That's not the strategic one yet. Oh, yeah. we're not there yet. Okay. Okay. I, just, I want to be sure we cover the whole chapter. No, we're almost there. You okay. Want to keep going. Yeah. Okay. This is great. <laughs> we're, 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 we're one away from strategic. <laughs> okay. If, if uh -huh. you're bored, I I can totally. Do you really? There's one we didn't talk about. No, I want to really go through okay. this you just are. step by step. Let's well, like really okay. really dig into it because I'm loving it. So well, you have you have really you've like made it more clear than anybody has ever made it. So, um, the next to last section before strategic, which is the last section, is called moods and temperament. And it's the way that we can be in moods, including even major things like, of course, depression and mania become mood disturbances that take over our whole psyche and can make us irrational. But we, without having a, a pathology of it, all the time people have transient mood states and, um, or persistent mood states. But if, if I'm in a sad mood, that's going to provide emotional coloring to everything I do. So in a sad mood, if I hear, uh, I'm trying to think of an event that could be looked at either way, if I hear that um, right now we're trying to have the Democrats and Republicans come up with an agreement to avoid the fiscal cliff, if I'm in a, let's say I'm in a pretty frustrated and kind of irritated mood, and I hear suddenly that there was a deal, I don't know what the deal was, I'll probably think, oh great, you know, I bet the Democrats caved in. But if I'm in a pretty optimistic and positive mood, I may think, I'm a, I'm a Democrat, I guess that's coming across. I might think, oh great, you know, maybe the Republicans and Democrats were more compromising. Or, I mean, anyway, I probably shouldn't talk about politics too much during this discussion, but I think that, um, you know, anything, a job change, an opportunity for, um, uh, you know, even, even things that, if I'm in a good enough mood, finding out that there's, um, like when the university had to do some um, hours restriction to save money on the budget, so we had to take a certain number of days off. If I'm in a good enough mood, that's great news. Even though I might really benefit from the income, I could use the days to do things I want to do. If I'm in a really worried mood, um, that's really going to worry me about finances. So our moods also influence us independently of just the logic of the situation. Mm. That's about just moods themselves can color a whole way of seeing reality and taking in information. Uh, and we carry those moods. I have a friend who's very depressed, so his whole life is kind of revolving around that depression right, right now. Right, or right. if you're kind of an optimistic person, you've got that optimistic mood right. that you kind of go through life. Or so, so that's kind of this emotional quality that we carry uh, with us. Um, and that's like not necessarily a logical thing. It's right. Not a right. Rational well, thing. It's just some. Yeah. Well, two doctors in different moods, having hearing the same history of a patient, might actually have different prognoses. One may be um, make a better have a give the patient a really different, more positive view of his or her future. The other might give a patient a negative one. That's really bad. So we, you know, it's true that if we just let doctors just kind of act out from whatever mood they're in. That would be really unhelpful. So I take that complaint very seriously. And uh, go ahead. Okay, this is a question that's a, you know kind of maybe stretching it, but wouldn't the the view the that you have to be detached and be in this state that wouldn't that be a mood in itself because it has an emotional it has an emotional constellation to it. I don't know if that makes sense. Am I oh, kind of it really makes sense, and, and my a project I'm just starting now is to work with um, therapists who volunteer all over the country to work with veterans and their families coming back, veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And one reason I'm working in that area, I care a lot about emotional, um, as you know, obviously emotional relationships. And one of the main things that's so sad is I would say almost every veteran, but that's obviously an exaggeration, but Many more veterans, you know, a certain subset of veterans have really significant difficulties psychologically, PTSD, that we need to handle as a society and help them with. But let's say that's 20%. I would say some much bigger number of veterans that don't have full blown PTSD, but who've seen active combat or um, terrible things, come back and they're emotionally detached from their family. And they suffer enormously they suffer and their families suffer from their emotional detachment. 
to the point that they may not, there's a play about this by a veteran, they may not feel joyful when a baby is born. This is what led Judith Broder, my mentor, to start the Soldiers Project, where therapists volunteer to work with patients and families to help them regain a sense of emotional aliveness as opposed to detachment in their relationships. So I would say detachment is a very profound state of being that, that um, constricts meaning, emotional meaning in life to a terrible degree. So I think you're mm -hmm. right. So that, that fits right in there. Yeah. So, um, so the word moods are always there. Aristotle, uh -huh. Aristotle got that. Um, philosophers increasingly understand it. We don't have an option of not being in some mood or other. And even quiet contemplation of the scientist is a kind of pleasant mood. And, uh, or doing a mathematical proof, you might feel a kind of engagement that's both exciting and stressful. But, I mean, there's not really a detached thought um, model for living a life without being subject to moods. Yeah, you know, oh, of detachment. yeah, okay. I, I, inter I interviewed uh, people about their about values, and somebody told me once, "Well, reason is my most important value." And then I said, um, "And it's kind of like in the logic reason." And I said, "You know, what does that feel like to you?" And he says, "It feels like security. That right. by being in a reasonable state, he has a sense of security. So he has a he has connected to that state of reason. He has a sense of." Security, and he said that when I he said when I was uh, you know growing up, people you know kind of made fun of me, and I didn't know how to act and all that kind of stuff. And then I found if I act very logical and reasoned, that I could think things through, and it gave me a sense of security. Oh, that's beautiful. So, so it's actually, I mean, so you have that. It's that that um, associated linking, right? That the yes. even the, even the reason and the disassociation has emotional linking to it. Yes. So in some sense, it's not even a, it's not even a, to be detached, like you're saying, is almost like you can't even do it in a way, or... Yeah, I, yeah. It's, I mean, detachment is, uh, it, it's a, a, a conscious state, like Sir William Osler, right after his daughter died, went back to work and was, quote, detached. But of course, at an unconscious or pre-conscious level, he was grieving. So detachment, or it, grieving may sound too active, but he was at a loss. A tremendous emotional um, uh, uh, darkness was there. Um, so detachment is a, is, a, is a pseudo state in a way. You're right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really where the moods critique becomes um, you know, self-defeating, because we can't really have doctors who aren't in a mood. <laughs> uh -huh. But we can have them become conscious of their moods. And I definitely think that when someone, I'm not saying all moods are fine. I'm saying that doctors need to attend to their own moods and make sure in a sense that they're in a good enough mood to go to work. If they can't be in a good enough or calm enough mood themselves, or you know, calm meaning including to be able to feel sadness or grief with a patient, they don't have to be neutral. But if they're in a real depression of their own, they're not in a state to listen to other people. Similarly, if they want to hypo, some doctors, a lot of doctors be, are very high energy people and are kind of hypomanic where they're always so cheery that they can't feel the sadness of other people's experiences. That's not really an appropriate mood to be taking patient's history. So, so, but there are things you can do about all of that. I mean, you can get treatment for major depression or true mania or even hypomania. But if you're just dealing with the day-to-day -day mood fluctuations that all human beings struggle with, there's a lot of evidence showing that mindfulness-based practices, which can be very brief, as simple as taking a deep breath, counting to 10, you know, all kinds of things like that can really help doctors kind of adjust their mood for the patient they're with and listen to the patient. So. Okay. And and so that's uh, moods and temperaments. Yes, yes. And uh, next was to strategic nature of emotions. And this is the last part. And in a way, it wraps up everything we've just been talking about. But in this, what I go to is basic, I look again at basic philosophical theories of emotions. And this, I said a little bit about this at the beginning. But it, at, at the very core, the Cartesian, Descartes, Cartesian, Kantian, and other very prominent Western views of philosophy, um, the views of cognition are that, in fact, Kant calls it pure reason, is that reason can only get at the truth if it's completely disinterested, detached from any strategic motivation. 
If I need a mathematical equation to come out a certain way, then I'm not doing math. If I need um, an analysis of historical archives to come up with a certain answer, then I'm not doing history, you know, according to that kind of thinking. And there's a lot of validity to that. You know, if we have to have, if we have, you know, we need, I believe in the scientific method. I believe in all the statistical and other tools we have to try to um, eliminate bias in how we look at data. So I'm all for um, building methodologies to help us have, to de-bias our analysis of things. On the other hand, you know, there's this question about being a doctor with a patient and the idea that your emotions will influence you, you know, to see things over in an overly rosy way, to make yourself feel better about the patient, or in Ms. G's case, to get rid of the patient quickly if you're feeling too helpless. Or um, So there's this concern that if you have too much um, influenced by your own... We can that, that'll that'll okay. go away. The machine okay. catches it. Okay, okay. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> yeah, it only rings when it, once the machine catches it. So. Okay, great. Um, so this is where I was saying that just because something strategic doesn't entail that it can't provide us knowledge of reality. That's my argument here. Um, of course, it, there's some strategic things that don't. You can be subject to totally wishful thinking. But just because it's strategic, which emotions always are strategic, I, uh, and what that means is that emotions don't happen only the way thoughts can happen because something in reality is there to be known. Emotions happen to help us um, be motivated and um, survive and love and attach. And emotions basically have a lot to do with um, practical experience with guiding us through our lives. So since emotions have this practical self-regulating, um, self-maintaining, they, they, they are to maintain and be and live our lives, not just to sort of relate to what's objectively the case. Um, they are always in that sense strategic in part, but how can they also be reality seeking? And my example was, I started to say this earlier, that we need to be socially um, through, through history, if we weren't, if empathy skills, which is a particular use of emotions, if I wasn't um, uh, cultivating a realistic appreciation of other people's feelings or of how a discussion is going with another person, whether we're about to get an, get an argument or historically whether tribes of people were about to get angry and start beating each other or dominating each other or loving each other, if people weren't pretty accurate at reading each other emotionally, they would have uh, been done in a long time ago. So that accuracy is actually a built-in part of emotions succeeding strategically when the, goal, when the emotions have to do with social cognition. And the example that I, the, the metaphor for this for me, or the, actually the analogy, is the same thing with, um, this isn't emotions, but think about um, subjective bodily experience, which is the proprioception is a great sense, sensory example that feeling of where your body is in space, you know, kind of knowing where your head is and your arms are and your legs are. Um, that subjective experiential sense of self, which it's not based on detaching from myself and then measuring myself in objective space and time. It's based on an intuitive um, experiential sense of where my body is, a sensory internal sense. That sense needs to be accurate or else I'd be hitting my head and um, you know, whamming my arms and legs into things all the time. So in order to be able to subjectively, strategically get my body through space for my own self-interest of survival, which is very strategic, I need to be accurate. And I, I see that as exactly true with social cognition, which is where the emotions of empathy come in. This is a tough one for me. This is, uh, you know, I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around this. Okay. And I have that sense of, you know, I, that, that of a three dimension. When I look at kind of sense reality, I have a, my sense in a three dimensional space, and I can feel my emotions, and you know, I can feel my concentration. You know, I'm concentrating on, and then also kind of being present, and a little bit of anxiety, like, oh, maybe I'm not going to get this. What she's <laughs> saying. So, so there's all these different, you know, kind of emotions kind of happening, and I'm feeling a bit of humor, you know, too, in in this exchange, and you know, desire to really get what it is that you're saying. So, um, and, and, and so I'm hearing to, is, one part is to understand reality that we need those emotions is, is one part of what I was hearing. And social I, reality. Social, social reality. reality. If, oh, me, mean, meaning other people's feelings. 
it, you know, oh, okay. is that if you didn't have your own emotions, it's not just you need them for all the reasons I've said to understand other people's emotions, but they need to be. The question here is, do they need to be accurate? That's the question, because the claim, oh. claim is that if something's strategic, it won't be accurate in this weird way. That the claim from Kant and Descartes are that what makes things accurate or true is that they're disinterested. They're not trying to help us survive or anything, because that's just going to distort us into wishful thinking or something. That, uh, that let, me, let me take it little okay. bits and pieces. I okay. need to take this like in baby steps. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go. Good, 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 good. So it's kind of like if I want to understand what's going on for you, Kantian uh, uh, thought is saying, well, you can't do it through emotions right. uh, because uh, you're going to be wrong. You're going to misread. I'm going to misread your emotions. So you've got to have these, these measurements. The, you have this, these structures to measure. And that's kind of the only way we can kind of get it, kind of reality. And, uh, but you're saying that we can actually, there's one part, I might not be really getting ac totally accurately uh, you know, what your emotions are and being able to read you, but I'm able to kind of work towards it, or yeah, it, it's, yeah. A, it's, one, it's one clue. It contributes. I, it contributes. I can keep working at it yeah. and, and keep uh, connecting more and more and connecting and deeper. And, and like now I'm seeing you give acknowledgement. I'm sensing, <laughs> hey, yeah, I'm on the right track, right? Yeah. So it's like you're mere, I don't know, you didn't mention much about mirror neurons. Um, I don't know. And so, I mean, one way you can see is that we're kind of, if we're using mirror neurons, that we're kind of reading, I'm reading my emotions, you know, through kind of my emotions, through mirror neurons, but then I can kind of keep refining that and keep working towards it and keep kind of uh, becoming more accurate in, in reading. I, in my recent work, I mean, in my very recent work, I'm having the um, lovely, lovely opportunity to, to work with Jean de Cidi, who is one of the main people who does the neuroscience, the brain science of empathy. And so we talk a lot about um, mirror neurons, which really are only one small part of all the parts of the brain that help with empathy. And um, actually, mirror neurons, this is, I mean, there was even a great um, PBS special on them, but they're not exactly what people think. Um, from my learning, I'm very involved with his work. Um, what we're really, the mirror neuron itself refers more to a um, behavioral capacity to mimic the other person's behavior automatically. But we have a, a complex apparatus in the brain where if we see someone else having pain inflicted on them, we can have the same parts of our brains usually light up as would if we were getting pain. Except, you know who that doesn't happen for? Doctors. John has shown that doctors, after three to four years of training, they don't light up. Their brain doesn't mm -hmm. light up mm -hmm. the way other, other normal peoples do. So I actually think we need a very complex view of how um, the neuroscience of empathy for doctors. Because something seems to happen where their, quote, mirror neuron, but it's actually a lot of stuff, um, isn't going to necessarily operate the same way as other people's, at least when they're doing painful procedures. This goes to my point, though, that that doesn't mean when they're taking a history that they might not light up. Um, and there's a good study that just came out this week, and there was an article in the New York Times this week about empathy in doctors and MRI studies of the patients' um, responses, after, you know, involving not exactly mirror, but you know, um, brain responses um, to pain and the doctor's empathy helping the patients, um, seeing the doctor's face if the doctor was empathic helped the patient feel less pain. So there's an awful lot going on in the neuroscience of empathy, but it's very complex, and I'm. Mm -hmm. I've been writing, and I will be writing more about it. Um, but but I would love to write a chapter about that. But it's not mm -hmm. in this. It's not in this. Yeah, book. yeah. So we're, we're covering <laughs> what's here in this book. So I'm right. getting too yeah. far afield. Yeah. So yeah. so that was the strategic. Is that I would, what, was I starting yeah. to get it? Then there's kind yeah. of this notion that that uh, you can study only through measurement. But you're saying that measurement and all that is an important tool. Yeah. So it's not yeah. throwing that part out. But that you do both. You do the measurement uh, part. And as well as the uh, the uh, reading the emotions yes. And, yes. and so you can do both and, and they com may complement or that's a great way to put it. I mean, what I'm really <laughs> just doing is completing there the full conceptual counter argument to the philosophical claims that because emotions can arise with little evidence, that's gut feelings, because they can show inertia, they can last too long, because they relate by associative linkages, subjective meanings, because they can um, pervasively color reality as moods, and because they can function to preserve ourselves, which is being strategic, 
philosophers for a long time have said because of all those things, they can't contribute to reason. And what the chapter tries to do is show that, that in each case, that doesn't pr prohibit them from contributing to reason. And the most strong claim is in the strategic area where I say, ultimately, the book tries to show that we actually wouldn't be able to grasp social rea reality fully without empathy. We would mm -hmm. actually miss an important part of reality if we were robotic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's uh, the chapter three that's kind of rounded it out. Um, you know, you had said you had, uh, you know, we've gone for an hour and, uh, you know, the next chapter is actually kind of the, it seems like the, the meat one. of, of <laughs> the important one. So maybe that would be a good one for the next topic yeah, so we can really focus on, on that chapter. And I think even a separate um, clip on that would be really, because people great. might want to go directly to that. So that would be great. This so might be, a, yeah. So this might be a good spot to uh, end this conversation. And this has been fantastic. I'm so glad I'm getting this opportunity to get this tour through this. This is just wonderful. <laughs> well, as you know from doing so much work in your own life, there's no greater pleasure and honor to the work than to have somebody like you pay so much attention to it and hope that it'll make it accessible to people for me, which I really thank you for. I really thank you for that. Oh, great. Well, I look forward to our next uh, conversation, okay. which is, uh, I think, in two weeks. So we'll okay. pick it up at that point. And okay. So everyone stay tuned. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll stay on while you sign mm -hmm. us up. While you